Howdy and welcome to the 10 Week Bible Study. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and I can't wait to jump into Revelation 3, 1 through 13 today. Well, welcome back to the 10 Week Bible Study. This is week two, day three of our study of Revelation. Let's pray before we start. Jesus, open our eyes and our ears to hear what your word has to say to us. Fill us with the knowledge of you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, let's jump into God's word. I'll be reading today from the NIV. This is Revelation 3, starting in verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Seven spirits of God, pausing right there. That's something we're going to come back to later in the book of Revelation. This is a little bit mysterious. What are the seven spirits of God? Uh, There's a lot of thoughts on this. This is one of those figurative things in the book of Revelation that we don't really get a clear answer from. But he is the one that holds the seven stars. And we did, in the first chapter, get an answer to what are the seven stars. They are the messengers, right? They are the, 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 either the angels or the pastors, however you want to see that. They are the, the, the messengers of the seven churches. He's the one that holds them in his hands. He holds all of these things in his hands. So that's how Jesus introduces himself here. Verse, uh, continuing on in verse one, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I've found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. If you haven't already picked up on this, Sardis is one of those that the Lord doesn't have anything good to say. Verse three, remember therefore what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time uh, I will come to you. Verse four, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. Pausing right there. So there's just all this negative uh, towards Sardis, right? You've got a, a reputation that you're alive, but you're you're not. You're almost dead, right? The works that you've done, they're unfinished. Like you're doing things, but but there's things that are lacking. So he's saying, remember the teachings that you've been given and hold fast to them, but repent of the things that you're doing. Repent of the things that you're doing. And he tells them the same thing that he tells Ephesus. Otherwise, I'm going to come and I'm going to take away your lamps. I'm going to come like a thief in the night and I'm going to steal from you what you, you think is valuable. The Lord is not intimidated to take away from us the things that we think we're doing for him to honor his name. Right. Well, the Lord wouldn't. The Lord wouldn't do that. The Lord wouldn't take away the church. Right. The Lord wouldn't let this church collapse or fold. Right. That's bringing glory to God. No, 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 no. He he cares more about your heart before him than he does what the lost people, the Gentiles, the pagans around us, what they think of us in him. Right. I mean, think about how God appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus. He can do that to anyone he wants. Do you think that, that, you know, oh my gosh, well, if, if like word of this scandal, word of this thing gets out, you know, it could really hurt the name and the witness and the testimony of Jesus. We don't want people to find this out. This is just so common. These kinds of back, back door, uh, back room conversations that go on in churches, especially ones that are walking deeper into sin. And, uh, Jesus is like, Hey, I, I don't need you to bring honor and glory to my name. I can stop anyone on the road that I want. I can make them blind. I can terrify them with my presence. I don't need you. But he wants us. He likes us. He loves engaging with us in that process, but he doesn't need us. And if he doesn't need us, he's not intimidated to remove us and remove that church if we run afoul of what he's commanding us to do. 
So there's the people in Sardis who have not walked into this sin. Overall, this church is really um, falling into the sin, struggling with this, but there's people there who have not. It's like, they're going to walk with me dressed in white. Now, this is an interesting thing because every believer we're going to find out is going to get the white clothes to wear. So does that mean that the ones in Sardis that have walked into the sin and have walked away from the Lord, the one that the Lord's are the ones that the Lord's speaking to here, are they not believers? Like, what does this mean? This 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 calls all sorts of things into question. It's like it's, we're we're especially talking to the leaders here in the church. I don't have a good answer for that, but it's a it's a terrifying thought. It's a terrifying thing to um, to think about that, and we know. That you know, Jesus said there's going to be people who on that day when they face the judgment seat of the Lord and they come before him, they're going to say, Lord, Lord, you know, didn't we cast demons out in your name? Didn't we heal people? Didn't we do all these amazing things in your name? And he's going to look at them and he's going to say, depart from me for I never knew you. We can do a lot of stuff in the name of the Lord without actually knowing him. Oh, Lord, don't let it be. We would do anything in your name without having that thriving relationship with you. Lord, in any way that we run us astray and, and, and fall away from you, and that would you, would you bring us back to you, that we would have that thriving relationship with you, Lord? Oh, yes. I love reading through these things. These are some of the most soul-piercing parts of the entire Bible, in my opinion. This revelation of Jesus, I think it's one of the greatest revelations of Jesus in all of the New Testament, all of Scripture. I think the book of Revelation is a greater revelation of who Jesus is than the Gospels. In, in, some, in some ways, yes. These kinds of things pierce my heart. Oh, you know, it's like... Like I feel at times like the apostles at the at the Last Supper. It's like, wait, is it me? Is it me? Are you talking about me? Am I the one? It's like, Lord, oh, don't let this be me. And I think that's the appropriate response. I, I think the inappropriate response is to say, ah, oh, well, that's not me. It's like, no, no, we have to see ourselves in each one of these seven churches and say, oh, Lord, don't let that be me. Don't let that be me. This entire book, this is a mirror to hold up to ourselves and ask ourselves the question, is this me? Is there any way this me? Because Jesus is saying, listen, all you've got to do to be made right is to repent. Repent and turn back to me. Verse 5. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but I will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The book of life, right? The book of life. This is, um, all right, nothing against the Hallmark Company because I live in the Kansas City area and Hallmark the the company that makes the greeting cards and the 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 movies with the single plot um it, it's it's headquartered here in Kansas City. I like Hallmark. I really like Hallmark. But I, you know, greet it's you know, they they're synonymous with greeting cards. So I've always called this uh Hallmark Christianity. And again, it's not a slight against Hallmark. There's wonderful people there. It's it's just that there's this greeting card Christianity mentality that um, because it's completely unbiblical, but it's very ingrained in uh, at least American culture is that we're going to go to heaven. We're going to die. We're going to go to the, the gates of heaven. And St. Peter is there and he's got two books, uh, you know, list of good stuff and list of bad stuff. And did the good stuff in your life outweigh the bad stuff? And if so, okay, you get to come into heaven absolutely not how eternity works. That is a complete fabrication, a complete lie. That's what I call Hallmark Christianity. It's, it's a, it's, it's a greening card reality. It's not the Bible. Absolutely not the Bible. We will come before the Lord, come before the judgment throne of the Lord. And the books that will be open will be the books of the things that we've done. Yes, our works, but they matter nothing 
about where we spend eternity. The only thing that determines where we spend eternity, whether it's the lake of fire or the presence of the Lord, is the book of life. Is our name written in the book of life? And the the way, and, and so there's some interesting things going on here. It says, you know, if, if we overcome, he will not blot out our name in the book of life. And in that, uh, some people look at that as saying, well, your name from the moment you're born, your name is written in the book of life. And some people will say, and this is, this is a very, uh, well-established theological idea. And there's some, um, merit to it specifically for passages like this is that, um, the Lord would not take people up to an age, an age of accountability. At some point, the Lord is going to hold, at some age, the Lord is going to hold you accountable for accepting him and following him or not. Right. And, and, um, some people have, uh, some denominations and groups in the past have said, well, this is the age of accountability, right? Um, so they'll have, you know, catechisms and things like that before that. Um, other people, you know, the, some people say, well, everyone's different. So is the age of accountability different? Uh, who knows? Right. That's, that's all sorts of debates about that kind of stuff. But this kind of lends credibility to the idea that everyone's name is written in the book of life, but they come to some age. And if they haven't chosen the Lord, their name is blotted out of that book of life. And so, you know, we don't want to be blotted out because that is that book is the thing that's going to give us entry into eternity. Um, and, and who knows? you know, at the throne of God, maybe he's going to be sitting in front of the gates, just like all of the pictures. And maybe Peter's sitting right there with him. Right. Um, but the book that's open, it's not, have you done enough good things to outweigh the bad things in life? It's, have you accepted Jesus as your savior? Have you pledged all of your allegiance to him? Have you given him everything? Have you done that? And if you have, your name is in the book of life. If you haven't, it's going to be blotted out. That's the important thing. If you haven't done that, I'm going to pray with you at the end of this episode. I want you to pray with me today. If you've never accepted Jesus, I want you to do that because that is how your name stays in the Lamb's book of life. And if you overcome, that name will be there for all eternity. And the Lord will acknowledge your name before his Father and for all of the angels in eternity. Verse 7. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. This is specifically referencing a prophecy to uh, Joshua the high priest, during the days of Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah, Ezra, I can't remember, I think, uh, I want to say Ezra, actually, earlier, a little bit earlier than Nehemiah. No, I'm sorry, not during the days of, of Ezra and Nehemiah, but uh, actually a generation before them. Um, so the first of the exiles to return to Jerusalem, this is actually a prophecy that the key of David is going to be given to him. And... Um, Now, what the meaning of that key of David is, is somewhat mysterious, actually. But what Jesus is saying here is this key, right? It it opens all the doors. It's the master key, right? It's the, it's playing the legend of Zelda. It's the master key. It's the one that does all the things, whatever. If you get that reference, great. Um, uh, You know, this key, uh, Jesus has got this key. He can open everything right? He's, he's, he's got access to everything that he wants is essentially how he's introducing himself. All right. With that, verse eight, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of a synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews though they are not, but are liars. I will make them to come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Here we see that synagogue of Satan again, right? It's, it's somebody masquerading as something else, but the main thing is they're accusing these believers of being something that they're not. And in both cases, Jesus is like, no, 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 their accusation is false. You are mine. You are mine. Now, 
this feels like it's through the context of both of these things, it feels like it could be the Judaizers that Paul uh, so often in the New Testament confronts, right? The the Jews who, um, like Paul says, they're, like when he confronts Peter, it's like, you, you claim to be a Jew, but you don't even live like a Jew. You're not following the law. You're not doing all these things, right? And so, so it sounds like that, right? Where it's like, you claim to be a Jew. You tell all these Gentiles you've actually got to be converted to Judaism before you can become a Christian. You got to be circumcised. All of these things that they dealt with in the book of Acts that for the Gentiles is not true. Um, it feels like it could be that. More than likely, that's probably what we're talking about here, the synagogue of Satan. It's the Judaizers that Paul deals with. But we don't know that for a fact. So I don't like to say that's definitely what this is. I think it's very likely that's what this is. But I don't know that for a fact. Whatever they were teaching, it's bad. And, and these people, they're holding against it. They're, they're holding to the truth against these lies, whatever they are. Again, this is not intended by John or the scripture to be anti-Semitic. John is not writing something anti-Semitic. He is a Jew himself. <clears throat> All right. Um, but Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to flip this on them in your case, and they're going to turn out and they're going to fall and they're going to acknowledge that, that I've loved you right? I'm going to give you vindication in this. Verse 10. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So this is a specific promise to the church of, uh, of Philadelphia. And by extension, can we expect this for each one of us. And this is one of those things that's very interesting. So we're going to see later in the book of Revelation, there is a promise of supernatural protection, but it's not a promise of supernatural protection for everyone all the time. So this, right, is the Lord going to keep everyone from the hour of trial? It's going to, the from essentially the, 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 um, the great tribulation that's, that's kind of, it doesn't say that, right. But, um, by the context here, we're essentially talking about the great tribulation. Um, he's going to keep them from that hour of trial. Is he going to do that for everyone? Not necessarily. This is one of those where even in the context, it doesn't necessarily seem like it's universal. Could it be? Maybe. I don't think so. I don't believe so. And we'll see why later in the book of Revelation. Um, but Philadelphia is one of those where the Lord has nothing negative to say, only positive things to say. And this is that promise. I'll hold on, hold on, right? We're going to see him say right now, hold on to what you have. Verse 11, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown, right? Jesus is saying like, there's nothing you're doing wrong. You're in the midst of this persecution and all these kind of things. Just hold on to what you have. Hold on to what you have. If you can endure patiently, right? You've, you've, you've kept that command and you've stood firm. If you will endure, I will, I will keep you from this hour of trial. Hold on, right? Again, it's like, listen, I'm not asking for you to like be these massive overcomers and do all these great works and all these things. I'm just asking you to hold on because in your context, it's so challenging. I see how challenging it is, right? There is not one size fits all, right? Jesus understands some people they're going through it. And he's like, I'm not asking you to like take over the world here. I'm just asking you to hold on and don't give in to the, the, the terribleness that is your culture. I mean, sometimes that's all that the Lord's asking here. And that's what he's saying here. Verse 12, to the one who's victorious, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All of these promises, all of these things, they're promises to Jesus. They're things that God is going, the God the Father is going to give to Jesus as a reward for the blood that he shed for redeeming mankind to God. And in turn, Jesus is going to turn and give those very same offerings, those gifts to every single one who overcomes in the name of Jesus. 
the salvation that we've been offered, we don't deserve it. The forgiveness of sins, we don't deserve it. But on top of already getting what we don't deserve, he gives us everything. He literally gives us the keys to his kingdom. Like I said earlier, if you don't know Jesus, if you have not determined in your heart to follow Jesus for the rest of your life and for the rest of eternity, if you've not told Jesus, I want to give you everything, I want to pledge my allegiance and give my heart and my life to you, if you have not done that before, I want to invite you to do that with me today, to enter into eternity with him, to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. So you will inherit eternal life with him. If you want to do that, pray with me today. Jesus, I am a sinner and I repent. I want to turn away from every wicked thing, everything that I've done. And I want to pledge my life to you. I want to give my life to you, Jesus. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. Jesus, would you save me from my sins and receive me into eternity? And would you fill me with the Holy Spirit? In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that for the first time, I want you to reach out and contact me. All of my contact information are in the description of the show notes. Please reach out to me if you just prayed that for the first time. For the 10-Week Bible Study, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and I can't wait to see you next time. Well, thanks for joining me today on our study. Would you like and subscribe to wherever you're watching this? It really helps more people find out about our broadcast, and my heart is for more people to fall in love with God and His Word. 